Um, make them achieve public outcomes. Or make them, that's a bit strong. Help set, set the, because I think that's also the counterpoint too, is I do think that to some degree the different types of modes are being treated differently depending on when they're coming on, uh, on the scene. But I think to set up the system such that they do lead towards more public outcomes. Um, so anyway, so I just wanted to say that at the, at the outset. And uh, I'll jump in, I think, primarily first in, into the detail of our scooter uh, uh, efforts in the city, since we're obviously well known for that. And I think there's a real question as to why the city took the position that it did. I mean, it, instead of uh, saying, no thanks, we're out, please don't come here, the city said, okay, all right, we'll, we'll engage with this, and we will engage with it in as productive a way as we can. And so I think that story is representative of uh, a public-private partnership model, as well as an emerging mobility model. Uh, it has some of the benefits of the emerging mobility and some of the warts and some of the difficulties of that as well, and that's different than something that's a little bit more established. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about our Breeze Bike Share system. I have it in the end in the slides, but I think it's worth a little bit more of a conversation because that's a role in which um, now it's four years old. Uh, as you know, it, we're partnered with UCLA and Beverly Hills, and we were partnered with, with West Hollywood um, to create a kind of sub-regional system. And in that case, the city actually took a very different role. We were much, we were much more the catalyst. We own the bikes, and then we pay an operator uh, to make it happen. So, since people love us talking about scooters, we'll talk about scooters first, and then we'll get into some of the other things, and hopefully we'll have time for robust discussion, because I think there's some really interesting interplay between what's happening kind of locally in our small government world and some of the, the broad themes that, that you were learning about. So why, I always like to start with why, why did we say, okay, we'll play, was um, just really pointed the finger at uh, vehicle transportation being an area where we need to work much, much harder. We also know that um, our residents are still driving for <coughs> almost 70% of their trips. Um, it, you know, even for really short trips, so you've got lots of cold engine starts that are super inefficient, really polluting. Uh, we have a lot of work to do there. And our employees, even though they get a bad rap in the west side, you know, employee commute times and congestion, they actually do better than the residents most of the time um, in terms of, you know, having alternative commute patterns. And then we saw this pattern in 2017, and I'd have that, we do this every other year, and we're just actually aggregating all of our 2019 counts right now, but I suspect we'll see another red number. Um, for many, many years, uh, we saw the numbers slowly going down, our vehicle counts throughout the city. So these are um, counts of all the vehicle crossings of all the intersections in the city. So it's not a number of vehicles, it's sort of prevalence of vehicles. And so for the first time in 2017, we saw it go up pretty noticeably. Um, Timing concurrent with the rise of TNCs in the downtown? Correlation, yes. Causation, no. But still interesting, I think. And it'll be really interesting to see if that continues to go up in 2019. But nonetheless, a concern. And then we also had a lot of plans and policies that set a pretty strong framework for what to do. Um, now, the circulation element is 10 years old, which doesn't seem old, but actually makes it ancient, given how much change has happened in transportation since then. It's, there's almost no reference to technology. Um, what it does do, though, is set up a really nice foundation of saying, we have a clear goal. Manage PM peak congestion by reducing demand for travel, travel overall. So take the full universe of trips in the city, convert as many of those as we can to bus, bike, walk, and transit, tra and rail, because we had Expo coming. And then, um, that will create the space to allow for additional housing growth and other things that we need to maintain a healthy land use pattern, a healthy economy, more affordable housing, things like that. So that was kind of the, that's the big idea. Um, and then we followed up with the circulation element with a bike action plan and a pet action plan and a vision zero plan. So a, a solid foundation. And then to refresh it a little bit, the council said, well, let's talk about some near term priorities. So they identified creating this new model of mobility as uh, a high priority for the community. So achieving many of the things that I talked about as well as this idea of kind of a more diverse system. And we started talking about it at this point as a bit more like a, a, a robust ecosystem of transportation. So without further ado, <laughs> scooties. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, we earned it, I think. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I think it's Tim, you're here, yeah? Tim posted on Twitter yesterday something that made me smile, which was that the local Trader Joe's now has adorned uh, the inside of the Trader Joe's with like bike wheels and scooter logos. And I think you said, you know, by the time your local Trader Joe's calls out, you know, this as your dominant pattern, you've really arrived. You know, um, you know I, I agree with that. I agree with that. So that's kind of nice. Um, so we were seeing a lot of things, um, you know, some good, some not so good, tons of community complaints. This was back in fall of 2017 when they first arrived. First in small amounts and then ever growing. And as they became more numerous, the, the public complaint, complaints really kind of went off the rails. And we saw a lot of this kind of stuff. So the city pivoted and said, well, we, we probably need a whole program for this. And we need some new rules. We don't know what they are. So we got, we got punt for a second. And so we punted. Uh, and said, all right, we've got this vending permit. Let's try and shoehorn that in. So at least there's some legal framework for these things to be operating. And that actually engages us in something that gets us uh, at least some insurance requirements, like some basic sort of risk management, um, and, and the ability to sort of have a more mono a mono conversation about helmets. Uh, driver's license verification, that was like the big outcry at this time was people seeing kids on these and saying it's just not safe. Um, as well as sidewalk riding, which uh, didn't get as much better as the driver's license verification did. But um, So we said, okay, well, well, let's do this interim approach. And then in the meantime, we started interviewing all the operators, which was actually really helpful in developing the regulations, but, but took time. So then we went, oh, sorry, uh, concurrently, we said, all right, well, the big thing here is that people don't know how to ride these things. So there was this interesting moment where, you know, you may not have the balance to ride a bike, but you probably have a general idea of where they should go. You know, most people kind of, you look around, you go, okay, that's sort of, most people are in the street. All right, generally go on that side of the road. And so there's sort of this cultural baseline knowledge, I think, around other devices, but e-scooters really didn't have that. Uh, and I think the base, if people had baseline knowledge, it was right on the sidewalk, right? They're like, oh, a little kick scooter, it's probably a kid, the kid's on the sidewalk, that's probably where the kid should be, that sounds about right. Well, that's not right in Santa Monica, so we said, all right, well, we probably need to bite the bullet, and we, we actually made a campaign and said, all right, uh, let's, let's put together some artwork, something that's visual, simple, legible, and we started putting it up in the city. We put it on the, the sides of the parking structures. We put it in social media. We paid to wrap the uh, Expo line trains with it. Uh, we paid to wrap the big blue buses with it. It was like, let's get whatever assets are circling around and getting eyeballs out there in the world and try and help people at least have the basics. So it's really kind of, this phase was truly sort of risk management. Um, just getting the basics out there. And, the, and we uh, asked the companies to participate, and they did contribute to the cost of that campaign, uh, which we then redid again the next year. So that was, that was good. And then we said, OK, well, what do we want to do with this pilot program? The council said, OK, do a pilot program. Uh, and we had, we had to think, well, why, why are we doing it as a pilot? Why aren't we just sort of jumping in? And we realized, well, we didn't really know enough to write regulations. Once you write the regulations, they become incredibly inflexible even at the local level. I mean, we're not Congress, so it's not like we need a bill that has to take, you know, a year and a half in lobbying or anything, but it still takes six months. You know, it can take a while, you can have controversy. So we thought, well, let's, let's just admit we don't know enough to lay down the foundation. Let's lay down what we can, but then actually have this flexibility to work together and, um, and have, you know, work, you know, find solutions collectively. Um, it it uh, also enabled us to explore kind of working with the companies and uh, to go to dive into data and to use data for the benefit of the overall system management. Um, so we ended up having a structure where we had a, a one year, well it's like a 16 month pilot. Uh, and what we did is we said, okay, well, we can't work with everybody. We have to manage the amount of time and energy. So we did a competitive process. And we said, okay, um, we'll try and find the best operators out there that seem to be able to deliver a, a good device and good operations plan. And we'll work with them. And we'll work with them during that period of time. And then council said, we want you to leave the number of devices flexible. Because there was all this, like, well, where should they go? And how many should we have? And where should they be located and a lot of, lot of sort of uncertainty around that. 
Um, so we said, okay, we'll do this this short term this short term program. And at the time, the, I don't know how many of you were following the, the mobility data specifications, but that was pretty new. But we were working really hand in glove with them, with LADOT, and we said, okay, well that that's one of the ways that we actually could implement the dynamic cap if we had real time data um, and information about where things were going and when they were going, and then. All right, you know, if you if you have if your devices are getting a lot of rides, and this was the interesting thing. Now we say like, oh yeah, three or four rides, but at that time we didn't know what was normal. Like, uh, jump bikes in San Francisco was saying they were getting ten rides a day, and other people were saying, well, two is great. And you're like, well, from a regulatory <laughs> standpoint, what am I supposed to do with that? You know, and so you know we kind of by through the interview process asked people what they thought a good ride amount was. They said three to four, three for bikes, four for scooters. We said, okay, we'll go with that. And um, then we had the data to be able to say, all right, if we have above that, we might need some more. We'll allow some expansion of the fleet. If we have below that, we might want to sort of ratchet it down because we have too many. So that was kind of the basic premise. And this is, so in full disclosure, there's one, two, three, <laughs> four of these, right? And I, I leave these in intentionally because this is sort of the brain damage of this, but also I think il illustrative of some interesting <laughs> challenges, right? Which is like, how do you take something brand new and set up a rule structure that is both, both flexible and enabling, but dealing with risk, safety, equity, reliability, access, right? Like, how do you actually put that together? Um, and this was our first one. We have since just, you know, just a note, we went to council two weeks ago, and they uh, gave us the green light to go ahead and do a second pilot program. So everything we're going to go through right now is what we'll be working on over the next eight weeks to revise and update with what we've learned and what the council said were still sort of sticking points that they want more on or what we might want to back off of um, to get a better sense for um, to, that, that just turned out to be not, not so necessary. Because it's of no benefit to the city or the operators to be imposing regulations that aren't necessary. And that was sort of the sweet spot we were looking for. Like, what do, what do we need to say that doesn't happen naturally on its own? So, um, so this is the, all of these things, these are in a booklet. It's online. You can look it up if you're so inclined. Um, and it was important for us to have it posted publicly and available so that everyone knew what the, uh, what the rules were, right? This was transparency was was an important goal. So we said, okay, you know, our rules say here's here's the basics: timing, operators, devices. Um, that companies have to commit a person who's available to us all the time and let us know if that person ever changes. That means we need to have a partner, really, uh, which seems kind of weird and wonky. But at the same time, when a company gets a permit. You know, this happens all the time in local government. Someone grabs a permit, maybe they have an expediter who comes and does the permit, and it's their name on the permit, so then when something goes wrong and the code enforcement officer tries to call, they're like, I don't know, I'm the expediter. I don't know who, it's like, it was Joe Schmo. You know, can I have Joe Schmo's phone number? Well, no, I don't feel like I can give you that. So then all of a sudden you're kind of going, well, who am I in partnership with? So, seems wonky, but that's why. Uh, and then a whole host of fees, which I'll get into later, um, because and this is, I think, interesting. The belief was that the company should pay for the burden that the oversight was going to cause to the public. Which, okay, that's fair. If something sort of lands out of outer space and public budgets are what they are, uh, what is the justification to people who think that thing that fell out of the sky should be thrown away to actually engage with it and that burden? Should you know? Should should the average person who's never going to ride them pay for the management of that thing? That was the feeling. That's still a little bit the feeling, but I think it's interesting, at least as you're thinking about transportation more broadly, like what transportation really pays for itself. You know what? You know. I think. I mean, you've all you're all studying this, right? I think that there's a real interesting tension here about the newer entrants into the market and what they have to bear financially or maybe said another way, the ways in which our general streams of transportation funding haven't made space for them to get the same, right? So it's either that they don't have to be held accountable for the cost or that uh, maybe the ways that we pay for transportation should be loosened up so that these, these devices become more generally eligible for that kind of subsidy. Um, 
And while we're on the topic of money, I think you know the thing that, that truly keeps me up at night, and Tim, you know this because I've said it publicly, it's so no surprise to you, but you know, is what happens, you know, right now we're in a situation where, you know, there's headlines every quarter about the massive losses that the transportation companies are having, right? There's like general public enthusiasm about technology is going to save us and get us out of congestion and and these great, you know, e-mobility devices are going to keep running and we're all supposed to just ignore the fact that, you know, you can lose $500 million a quarter and still keep operating. And at some point, that fountain is going to dry up. And I don't know when, and I'm not excited about that moment, but I think that if we are going to accept these devices as transportation, we should be worried about that, right? We should be worried about what happens when the, that public, that private sector subsidy runs out. And, and if we want to have those devices, um, which I think Santa Monica has said they, they do, right? What do we do then? So anyway, that's enough about money, but I'm sure, I think that's interesting. It's interesting, the money part of this uh, displays a number of different dispositions and biases, I think, that are otherwise hidden under all the hype. So. Uh, anyway, so what else did we ask for? Uh, we said, um, by the way, if you're going to leave, you can't just give your permit to someone else. You can't pass it to the next guy in line. You have to give it up, and you have to let us know with enough. Because you can tell early on we were already like, risk. Ah, what happens if you leave? Um, and then, you know, device specifications, we basically, for bikes, this was quite a bit easier because there was a much more robust sort of federal guidelines for devices. For the scooters, it was a little trickier. Um, but we tried to link to anything federal or state where we could. So we referenced the CBC and the scooter definition there. We referenced federal uh, things for bikes and also some CBC things for bikes, basically saying, you know, you need brakes, lights, bells, uh, things like that. Keep them in good main maintaining order. And then the unique things for these devices were um, this idea that you have to have a device ID that's visible from a distance, right? Um, and this is a funny thing that the community really wants. They are just really into this, which I think is really funny. But, you know, hey, I don't know, maybe it's like having a, a vehicle license plate. Maybe it's not a bad thing if it's uh, part of this, this effort to legitimize new transportation devices. Um, and that the devices have to have safety messages on them and someone else to call. Like, don't call me. <laughs> don't call me when there's a scooter in the, in the sidewalk. Call the company. It's theirs. They should come get it. So put the contact information on there. And then in terms of technology, um, just enough embedded in the device to be able to do the things we needed to do to manage it. So real-time location status um, and other um, speed regulation was a big one. The ability to say, OK, you have to slow down in these areas. System design um, was, I think, broader, more of a 10,000 foot view, like you have to have equitable distribution and avoid over concentration. This is more the geographical part of it, right? You have to have this, this balance of providing enough everywhere so it's reliable, but not too much. You have to be active and moving it around. Um, you have to tell us when you're moving it around. You have to do these different things. Again, a city really involved in day-to-day -day operations, right? So kind of an interesting <coughs> dynamic, not something we do with taxis or you know, even, even a, yeah, many other systems we, we don't do that with. So deep in the weeds on this one in terms of uh, what the devices should be doing, how are you moving them around, and, uh, and what are you doing with that. Then maintenance, again, us deeply in the weeds in operations, inspections, repairs, replacements, record keeping, things like that. Um, that you have to have a customer support line, right? So this was, we're saying, well, okay, these are companies not, a, not necessarily typically transportation operators, so we want to make sure that if someone wants to call you, you're available for them to call, uh, and that you tell us kind of how fast you're resolving issues when, when people call you. Um, service event, it was, it was just more a sort of, uh, in, in the event of a, of a marathon or coast or other big events or an emergency, that you know, you'll stop what you're doing and you'll uh, get your devices out of the way so that they're not uh, impeding any other uh, responses. I th the multimodal connection one is interesting because it's something that we as professionals talk a lot about. Like, how much is it first last mile? Like, we say first last mile a lot. Um, in our regs, actually, this was something where we didn't really quite know what to say, so we just said we'd, we'd like you to work with other people, and we don't really know what that means. So try that. Um, <laughs> 
And so that's kind of interesting, kind of gray area that uh, as I was rereading, I thought, hmm, that's where we could, we might be able to do something. Interestingly, we did um, another UCLA, very bright UCLA grad uh, that was uh, working with us, uh, did some evaluation of how many trips started and ended at the Expo Line stations. And it was about 8 to 9% of them were stopping and starting it for transit connection. So not a huge number, but a big number. You know, it's extending the reach of, of major transportation networks, so that was good. Uh, again, a number you don't know what to expect, right? This is funny when you have no precedent, right? You're like, it could be it could be 80%, and it was like nine. <laughs> Should I be happy about that? I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, so anyway, uh, customer education, again, um, we're getting in the weeds and saying, you know, these are the big issues for, this is where you start to see what we were hearing from the community playing out in the regulations, where we said, you have to tell people about what the rules are, you have to tell them, no tandem riding, we hate that, right? No youth riding, that makes us mad too. So we're deep in the weeds about what you have to be telling your customers. Um, and then uh, providing basic rules of the road, because I don't know how many of you are, are riding them. Um, I started out as a cyclist, so when I ride them, I sort of feel like, wow, I'm nervous, and if I weren't already a pretty comfortable cyclist, I sh would be really nervous, actually. Uh, and so there is an interesting thing here about how do you get people to a general level of knowledge, and how do you get, how do cities get companies involved in getting people to the right, to the right amount of knowledge to use their devices safely, and how do we, how do we move that a little bit? Uh, and then we also say to protect the general public, even the ones that aren't going to use it, and you have to, you know, it has to be kind of both virtual as well as like face to face or objects, and you know, you could do advertising, you could do lots of different things. And then we have at the very end this little thing about income equity programs, which then over the last year actually has, I think, grown up to be a, one of the major issues for us. It's it's a small reference in our current admin regs. I think it's something we are going to be working on a lot. This idea of how does it become affordable to more people? Right? If it's public transportation, it needs to be a reasonable cost for lots of trips to provide lots of different access for lots of different people, uh, and how do we actually kind of move the needle on that? I'm still not done. Um, <laughs> we talked about the data, and then uh, we said, well, since you probably aren't sick of us yet, you have to tell us every week what happened. Uh, incident operations, maintenance, outreach, um, a summary of, of trips and things, which I think ultimately we ended up really more getting out of the MDS data. Um, but basically, like, you know, provide us with what's happening uh, out there and give us a summary so that we have some insight into what you know. Uh, and then you have to work with us on uh, facilitating user surveys so that we have a sense for what's going on out there. Because um, at the end of the day, MDS does not collect, or the city, yeah, does not collect any personal data, right? We don't know why you're riding, we don't know who you are, we don't have your credit card information, we have none of that stuff. So, you know, in our practice, right, we want to know, well, what would you take taken otherwise? What was your mode shift? And so we had to do the surveys to understand that. And then, last but not least, um, the insurance identification and legalese stuff. Uh, we also said your parking has to be certain ways. This has turned out to be really hard because we, <laughs> I think our website uses the term furniture zone. <laughs> you should put it in the furniture zone. And so that's really a way to make sure that people have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> um, and so we then, like, our code enforcement said, well, that's really not enforceable for us. Over time, we modified this. We said, okay, let's give it some boundaries. Uh, we said, okay, 48 inches for ADA. And then we said, well, and we could immediately impound you if you're in a bus stop, if you're uh, um, blocking a loading area, a fire hydrant, a parking meter, other things that are kind of like stuff that other people have to get to we could impound you in that case. Now we didn't have, we weren't excited to impound. Impounding is kind of a pain. Uh, it's, it's laborious, you gotta store the things. Um, but we said, you know, we need to have something that gives us that any, the ability to do it. And we also said, we don't want the devices just sitting around. They've gotta be uh, used, right? So if they're not used, you are, it's your responsibility to come and get them. And then if they're broken, you have to come and get them as well. Um, and then we also put the burden on the operators in terms of like talking to their customers about how to learn where to park, right? So we were trying our part, and they had to try their part too, which, and they have different tools, right? They, they have access on the app, they can do things on the map, they could pin you if it's wrong, as you know, that you have to take a photo, um, things like that, so put that on the operators. So I think I'm finally done with all of that. Um, I'm gonna skip over this stuff, I think, for a second and go to something more interesting, which is, well, what happened, right? So in the span of 12 months, we had 2.7 million trips, roughly. 
um, which is pretty awesome. Um, we were very happy to learn that, and this was something that we were able to learn because we had the MDS data. Um, otherwise, you know, it's, it's a lot of guessing game, uh, and so having that data access was, was really good. Um, and ridership has, has stayed pretty constant, you know, it ramped up in a pretty straight, relatively straight line, uh, and it stayed around 300,000 uh, trips a month, even as it starts to get colder and the visitation starts to, to fall. Um, we're still having pretty uh, pretty high ridership, which which was impressive. Um, we also found out through the survey that I mentioned, we asked the companies to work with us on, that 49% uh, of people said that they would have otherwise been in their own car or in a TNC or other kind of vehicle, which you know we were very happy with. That was that was our goal, and again, you know the kind of the kind of value of having the actual data to be able to, to start to talk to the public and dispel some of the myths about this new thing uh, and say, well, it's not just recreation, it's also, it's also uh, transportation. Um, it did displace walking trips. You know, that's, that was the big critique for a while, saying, well, you know, these people, they're just being lazy, they should be walking, and you know, walking's good for you. Um, and I think, you know, the way I look at it is, uh, it's nice to walk when you have time. It's, we all run late. And sometimes it's nice to be able to walk twice as fast as you can actually walk. <laughs> so I look at it as a, as a pedestrian accelerator, really, and something that fills in gaps when the system otherwise is, is failing you. Either you know the bike share isn't there, or the Uber is cost $20, or the, the bus is not coming, or whatever's happening. Right, or you're going to some place that's just inconvenient. Um, it's nice to have another option. So I, that doesn't bother me that much. Um, and then it did uh, obviously pull people from their own bikes and their own scooters, and some from transit, uh, but not a ton. And I should give credit to our big blue bus, who did not make much of a fuss about this program at all, or complain that we might be taking their trip. So kudos to big blue bus for being a good a good colleague for that. And um, people ride for a lot of things. You know, that, that recreation's up there, right? Can't deny it, it's, it can be fun, and people come to Santa Monica to have fun, so why not? And, but that a lot of people are using uh, these to get to and from work. Uh, or maybe they carpooled to their work site from La Cañada, and they wanted to go grab something to eat, or they had to go to the pharmacy during their lunch break. And so they, you know, dashed out to do that, and then went back to work. Um, so I think that it's, it's good in helping your car stay put if you came in a car or to give you some mobility if you didn't uh, or if you have a more sort of a fixed commute pattern. Um, people are also using it to just, you know, eat out, go back home, do shopping. So lots of different uses. So we were pretty happy with this too. Um, you guys could probably educate me about what, uh, you know, how this compares to other types of modes because uh, I've been deep in the weeds on this. But we were pretty happy with it just on its face. And this is a little bit older data, but it didn't change much over time. And you know, people always ask, well, how far are people going? Typically, it's 1.3 miles. That's, that's what it's been mostly from the start. It started a little lower, I want to say 1.1. But 1.3 miles is pretty much consistently what it's been. I don't expect it to change. Um, so that is a nice, that's a good sense of the geography of this type of device, how it might complement something that is better for a three to five mile trip, for example. So that starts to then show you some layering with bike share, where bike share trips tend to be more in the sort of two, three, five, you know, range, or and then transit, right, which might take you more to the seven to 15 mile range. So it's nice to sort of see a little bit of that. Um, this is time, not distance. Uh, right, it's duration over time. It's, it's t oh, sorry, that's true. Yeah, 12, it's 30, 30, 30 duration by time of day. Thank you. I just wanted right. to make sure that yeah, yeah, yeah. Did I do that? No, I didn't do it. I switched it out. Thank you. Yeah, so 13 minutes, uh, 1.3 miles. And then time of day. Um, we do see an interesting peak that it's definitely more of an afternoon type of device. Um, that's sort of interesting to, to just see that you really see this, you know, right before lunch and then through the afternoon and then falling off when it gets dark again. Um, so some differentiation there in terms of how people feel comfortable using it. So, um, looking forward, um, this is a little bit what we were talking to our council about, is that looking forward, um, we are really trying to craft this into how can this be more of a, a public mobility 
um, device? How can it be sort of start to start to become even more legitimized? I don't know if that's the right word, but it really start to be accepted as uh, as much more part of the community and part of how we think about Big Blue Bus or even Breeze Bike Share um, and acknowledging what we still have to solve. Um, and so I mentioned the equity thing. So one of the things we also did find out uh, throughout this process was that um, we're skewing heavily male, uh, two-thirds male riders, uh, and it's younger riders as well, at 25 to 34. Um, there's anything wrong with that. Got to know your audience here. Um, <laughs> it's fine. Uh, but that, you know, maybe there is something to be said for a three-wheel device that might feel comfortable for someone in their 50s or 60s, or someone who just doesn't have great balance, or um, maybe there's different ways to, to broaden that out a little bit. And we also did see that uh, for the time being, it's still heavily folks with more discretionary income, higher incomes generally. So that really pointed to us to the need for some diversification either to help people understand that the device is for them. Like for some reason they might look at it and go, well, that's just not for me. That's just not something I can do. Or they might look at it and go, well, this is not something I can afford. Um, so we have to kind of unpack that a little bit, I think. And you know, it's, it's expensive and it's getting more expensive. Uh, and so what is the role there? Uh, and again, this raises this question of, you know, is it possible for cities to demand more in terms of how the companies operate as well as say, keep your prices low and hope that they'll still survive, right? Like what's that calculus look like? Um, how do you both make it public and affordable as well as well managed and maintained and not burden on the public sector? Good question. Um, but we are seeing that, you know, at the rates that the devices have risen to, that you know you're getting pretty close to a when you, to a discount Uber or Lyft fare, um, maybe not even discount, right? If you go by, yeah. Some of these operators like offer low income assistance programs. Do you have any idea like what percentage of the trips are used by riders who utilize those? I don't have the percentage of the trips. I do know that, and this comes a little later, we had 290, 253 total signups for low income programs across the four operators. So. And that's not necessarily people. You could have a person who figured out how to sign up and signed up in a couple different operators. So it might be 200 people. It might be 175. We don't know. It would just seem low. Um, so that also spoke to this idea of like, well, do people, do they know? Do they know that they can have this low income rate? Do they know how to do it? Is it easy enough? Um, our council said two things when we talked about this. One was uh, on the issue of rates. Um, Make sure that this is that these devices are financially competitive with something that's a more polluting option because we want to continue to drive people to these devices, which pollute a lot less per mile, especially per first mile, than the others. Uh, so figure, try and figure that out, uh, and try and increase the utilization of these by having the companies go to where these people live. Uh, there was some concern about whether or not, you know, if, if someone in a, a living in a disadvantaged community signs up, is the device actually there for them? Do they have access? Uh, the device is being rebalanced into those neighborhoods. Those kinds of things are both that the council asked for. And that we still have pretty, a lot of community complaint about rider behavior. Um, we did see through the surveys that people are, we did two things, we sort of said, well, do you know the rules of the road? And people self-reported, well, whether they yes, knew the rules or didn't. And then we asked them specific questions. We said, Ellie, can you do this and can you do that? So a way to kind of like check whether they actually knew. And for the most part, 75 to 80% of the people know what the rules are. So that was good. Um, but we're still, you know, I guess it doesn't really take many bad apples to, spare, uh, to spoil a bunch. Uh, but we still have this problem of sidewalk riding and, and underage and, and tandem. And this maintain, this remains a, a big concern for people. Um, I think it speaks a little bit to the disruption of what people, you know, pedestrians said, well, I already, I, are, I, I already was limited to 48 inches of space. Um, maybe this wouldn't be so bad if you'd, given, if you'd given me 12 to 15 feet, but now that I only have my 48 inches, I certainly don't want you whizzing by on a scooter in it. Um, so there's this challenge too, is sort of how do you uh, manage change for people that are using other modes. Uh, for Santa Monica, we also know that a lot of visitors are coming from outside, so we have this like constant refreshing, right? So to maintain an 80% knowledge base amongst our visitors, we have to constantly educate because the visitors are always changing. Um, so that's a challenge for us. Uh, and this issue of, of safety, though I will say the good news is, is we think per trip, 
that the number of collisions is actually stabilizing a little bit and that um, we are optimistic that as people continue to uh, practice and learn and the devices continue to get better, um, that people will experience fewer, um, fewer incidences where they're injured. Um, many people are just injuring themselves. They're falling off by themselves. They're hitting a fixed object. This speaks to this idea of training and this, you know, and some familiarity with how to navigate yourself on the street to know it's dumb, right? But like, you can be totally taken down by a one and a half inch lip on a driveway mm -hmm. if you don't know how to do that. So, how do you help people? <laughs> <laughs> oh, somebody did, huh? So, no, I had, I had no personal experience with <laughs> So, anyway, so how do we help people learn those those things that when you're on these different two wheel devices that you know you have to you have to enter situations slightly differently. And street organization. You know, what, what are the ways we can really get the streets kind of better, better operating, better maintained, um, not having the oversaturation? I think, you know, unfortunately, um, having four operators that were, that, that were generally staying within the deployment, we, we said you can have a 30 rear devices in downtown, which would have maybe been fine if we had fewer operators, but when each of them put a third in downtown, it ended up being a heck of a lot of devices. And so, you know, probably rightfully so, in some cases, people complained and said, you know, this is a street wall, basically, and, you know, we, we want, you know, to take them too many bike racks, they're taking too much of the edge, they block the curb ramp, whatever it was, you know, I think that that, that ended up being a real challenge for us um, and for the companies. And that, frankly, these devices... Can I ask a question about that? Um, so, you've talked a lot about kind of what the public interest in this is, and it, it strikes me that... that uh, the companies have an interest in having sort of a loyal customer base who are using their devices, and so they have an interest in having a, a large enough density of devices that users who want to use them can, can find them. But the public interest, if, if, if it is in scooter mobility, is for someone to be able to get to a scooter. And that doesn't necessarily mean that each company should have sort of a sufficient number of scooters, which may oversupply from a, from a, a public need standpoint, but undersupply from the individual uh, a company standpoint, right. and how you balance that, because certainly one app that allowed you to, to si go into any scooter uh, could actually increase scooter access and decrease the number of scooters on the street. And I'm wondering if you guys have thought about the, the balance of what, what's in the public interest around this versus the business model that each of these companies is operating. Yeah, I mean, I think in a perfect world, having some unified, unified platform on which um, Devices could be available, right? There's some unified place where you could get all of the all of this um, companies and their availability. Plus, the city could then have that data and ask the companies to manage amongst themselves. That would be the ideal. Um, I don't think that we'll see that. So I think what we're thinking is in the interim that one of the only ways to deal with it is to reduce the number of operators, which you know reduces competition, which is not great for the consumer. Um, but might ultimately be more of a balance. And we don't know if it's two or three, but sort of bringing the number down might be the only thing for the interim that we can do until there might be either uh, agglomeration through purchase or maybe there's cooperation agreements between the different companies. They decide to sort of cooperate and, and share markets. Um, you see that a little bit with Lime and Uber. Um, so for the time being, I think we might have to take a kind of blunt approach, but I agree that over time, It, that's how we afforded to, to do 19 miles of green bike lanes in the city. So there's been some good stuff. I think where I start to get a little nervous is uh, Breeze is four years old and jump bikes are brand new and shiny <laughs> and electric. <laughs> so Breeze has a hard time competing. Um, uh, and it is the most affordable. It's 11 cents a minute and you just pay by the minute. There's no upfront, there's no baseline, there's no sign up fee, no nothing. Uh, as opposed to the one dollar for the first minute, and you know between twenty-five and thirty cents for each minute after that, so it's definitely affordable. Um, but unfortunately, it has done this since we started to have the program launch, right? So, 
it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that you know we're having our lunch eaten by someone else, and um, that has softened public sentiment to want to continue to pay for it. Uh, and I, and I say that not lightly. In that um, I think the concern is what types of reliability and affordability can we provide when we don't have fair control and we're relying on the private sector to provide the services alone and without a guarantee that they'll be there tomorrow. And, and this is a concern, I think. Um, and I, I'm not, this is, uh, I don't think I'm making it up. I, um, uh, there's a really interesting daily, uh, daily um, I don't know if you listen to the New York Times, the daily podcast, a really interesting one from a few months ago where they interviewed Uber at length and they, the representative was fairly open about the fact that they need to hold on and white knuckle it long enough so that they put others out of business and that doesn't mean just private, that means transit too, right? So, um, you know, I think that should be a concern for all of us and, and part of why I, I'm sort of curmudgeonly optimistic about these types of devices where I think that they've created new users I think they also might be poaching some pretty important baseline public services that are more like transit um, than than they are uh, than than uh, well they're, that are functioning like transit in an important way for for the public. Um, so this was a, you know like I mentioned earlier, Breeze was an area in which we had been catalytic, right? So we said you know let's go out let's get grant money. This grant money was made available over time for bike share. Um, and so we went out, we got grant money, we bought the bikes with grant money, we uh, got a sponsor who was willing to cover most of the operations cost. Um, and so we were able to piece together by being creative and a little nimble, um, a bike share system that helped move the needle on biking in Santa Monica. You know, it helped, they were not just 500 bikes you could ride, they were 500 billboards for think about your commute in a different way, right? Think about getting around faster. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's a little bit my moral of that story as well, is that why I think that um, part of when we're thinking about whether we're being catalysts or whether we're being facilitators or whether we're being regulators, um, I think one thing we have to think about is the long game as well as the moment that you're, you're in and the mode that you're in. Um, what does is, what is what you're doing in those realms mean for the total ecosystem of mobility in, in your area? Um, and I didn't talk much about being a facilitator. Um, I will say that I think we were a facilitator when it came to car share. Um, car share is something that, you know, San Juan has had a couple different iterations of and we didn't have to do a whole lot. Um, and, it, and we could have taken another path where we did more to kind of uh, to do free floating. But for example, we had Wave Car. This was a private company that, uh, I don't know, found some unicorn dust and could afford to give, <laughs> they, it, was, it was kind of a business model that made no sense, but they, um, they had electric cars ro uh, circulating throughout the city. They could park anywhere and they, would, uh, they asked you to sort of be, park somewhere where you could park legally for three hours, but they would take care of tickets and things like that. And you could drive for two hours free and as many trips you wanted in a day. Um, they have since, after they went on Shark Tank, have since uh, turned their business model away from a customer model to a, a business to business. So now you can you can get these cars if you want to drive for you know a different type of delivery service in the greets or a fill in the blank. Um, in that case, we didn't have to do much. We just had to sort of not not hit them with a stick, which is sort of what we did. We facilitated by doing nothing. Uh, in another case, Zipcar came to us and said, um, we would like to have some cars in Santa Monica. We said, okay, they had already had some deals with private uh, private property owners. And we said, okay, some additional ones on public right away that are more accessible to the general public would be good. So we did give them, you know, uh, in exchange for a three-year commitment to work in the city, we gave them 20 on-street parking spaces. So in that case, we facilitated by sort of saying, all right, let's, Let's, uh, let's come up with an agreement. Um, and then we also talked a bit to Cartago, in which case we could have facilitated, we chose not to, but we could have facilitated by, by uh, making a deal with them about uh, where they could park in the city, um, giving them some access maybe to preferential parking districts or other things. Uh, we chose not to go that direction because we already had wave car, we had zip car, and frankly the math of trying to figure out what the deal should be when, when they're free floating is pretty hard. 
Um, but that's a that's an I think car share is more a model where cities become facilitators. They tend to not come to cities looking for financial commitment. Um, now Blue LA, which you probably all know about, is different, right? That is a commitment to affordable uh, electric car share that required a fair amount of infrastructure. So in that case, they did use a lot of grant funds, and the city is participating financially. City of LA is, um, but I think that you know, generally speaking, I think that the the facilitator model for in Santa Monica, at least, has been more on the car share side of things. So, with that, I mean, I, I don't have any grand solutions for anyone. Um, I can just tell you that that um, that piloting is probably we look back favorably on that uh, on that model. That I think um, remaining nimble is one of the main things we have to do as cities, and that our policy has to stay flexible um, and be grounded in something that um, it's it's good time for cities and agencies to be coming up with new ability principles to guide their decisions to go or no go right you get calls every day from somebody who has a new cool thing and you have to you have to make a case for whether that new cool thing is worth the time that day uh, so having some framework for that is important and having it based in broader more traditional um, Policy doc documents, I think, is very helpful. Um, we ended up having to stitch together what, what we like in our circulation element with what we were missing uh, in, in the council priorities and kind of find something in the middle that gave us a place to work uh, and some ideas of, of what, to, what to do and what not to do. Um, and we continue to learn every day, really. Um, and you know, to some degree, we're, we've become more active at the state level. Um, the state has become much more interested. There's some interesting things developing at the state. Uh, one being, I think, the sort of questioning of the CPUC, the California Public Utilities Commission being the regulator for, for Uber and Lyft has sort of come into more sharp focus, and I think we'll be up for more discussion this year. I think that's healthy in this, to the extent that, you know, local, local impacts, uh, that, that congestion, the 14% increase in Vehicle trips, those local impacts um, are real. And having that um, decided at the state level and with state policy and covering so many different types of communities in the state of California is probably not the most effective way to do it. Um, similarly, there's some movement now on data at the state level that's looking to solidify or ossify some of the ways in which cities can use data, which I think is unhealthy at this moment. But I think over time we will need to establish some of those things at the state level to give some even playing field for cities and companies, but that at this moment it's too early. Um, so anyway, those are some of the, the, the broad things we're, we're dealing with. Um, stay tuned for our pilot 2.0. We will be diving in and going back to council in January with some of that. Uh, and trying to sort of take the next step forward in, in progressive and flexible regulation of these. So let's, let's I'm interested in, in your thoughts and questions and whether I missed an entire area you were interested in. Yeah. Hi, um, so in terms of the can you talk a little bit about what steps the uh, city Yeah, I think there's a couple. Um, you know, we looked at a franchise model so taxi cabs were, you know, basically uh, regulated through franchise. It's changed a bit in the last couple of years, but a franchise model enables the city to sort of trade exclusivity for some amount of fare control, and we knew that that structure would enable us to control fares. Um, we were concerned because that would again be a sort of inflexible model. So we ended up not, you know, we had it headed down that path before we went to council and said, well, maybe this is the way we can actually get to the equity outcomes. But then we pulled back and said, well, maybe we could still have the exclusivity or at least a smaller set of operators and see if there's another way we can get to the fair control. Another way would be that cities agree to help subsidize for certain performance levels, right? That, but again, the tricky thing there is what's good performance when you don't know, right? So, and especially when you start talking dollars, then everybody gets real sensitive about estimates. Um, so I think that that would, that would be one tool, right? Cities could say, okay, we'll subsidize the affordable ones. Um, so yeah, so ex market exclusivity that we wonder whether or not maybe there's a sort of side contract where we could agree to fares with the operators with some flexibility clause that we're just exploring right now. 
um, to sort of see if there's there's another way to do it. Um, I'm just wondering if you're looking into requiring these companies make scooters accessible for people with disabilities? Yeah, that comes up a lot and we are interested in it. Um, with the experience we have from operating Breeze Bike Share, um, I, I have to recognize, and watching Bike Share over the years really struggle with this issue. Um, the most productive models I've seen of shared mobility devices being uh, having different, uh, being made available for people of, uh, with different abilities is through a partnership with a brick and mortar or some other type of local nonprofit. That's where I've seen it succeed. Um, less so with the idea of having them circulating because I think then this idea of reliability becomes really tough if you have just a few different kinds of devices going around. Um, so that's more sort of deep into the like, you know, would you have a unique device? I think we would like to see more generally like all devices and, and be developed and designed in a way that maybe they have the flexibility for a seat. Um, I have seen one that comes with a sort of, almost looks like your center console in a car and a, and a seat can pop out of it. So you can use it while you're just standing, but if you need a seat, it's available to you and you could take it out and all the devices could be like that. Um, I do think some increase in stability, so whether it's a three-wheeled approach or a gyroscope, I, I don't care, um, but something that gives a little more stability. So we're, we're pushing in that direction. This idea of pushing product design still eludes us, right? Like how do you, aside from going back out and doing another competitive process, which, you know, is, is certainly a tool we have. Um, and might be the best one at the moment. Um, how do you actually compel design solutions is tricky. So, um, yeah, and it's and respect the the lead time in manufacturing. So we are struggling. We are thinking about it, and we're struggling with how to get to it in a timely way. Yeah. Have you been able to see how those infrastructure investments you were referring to perhaps induced certain trips to originate or sort of end in certain locations and areas? Um, and I'm also just curious, from your experience, um, other cities that are ostensibly progressive, like West Hollywood, why they haven't necessarily been as proactive on this front as Santa Monica? Do you think that's a matter of culture, capacity? Yeah, um, I think I think it is. Uh, I think it's both. Uh, it's you know, it's incredibly risky to. It it's much less risky to say no. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, the critiques about why are you doing this are, are intense. Uh, and there are people that email us daily and call it to question our sanity and our professionalism and our eyesight. <laughs> you know, so, and, and they, they contact the council and I'm sure they threaten to, you know, unseat them and things like that. So it's risky, right? Um, and I think you need to have clarity on what you think your community needs in order to say, and to say, this fits what we need. I think that's an important part of what I'm saying, like about sort of having a framework, a policy framework. You shouldn't take the solution and find a problem to fit it. You should define what your problem is and see who can give you a solution and say yes to the ones that can and no to the ones that can't. You know, And I think in our case, this was came at a good time in that, um, you know, we had a problem and, and it fit that, that solution, so. And as far as um, did the lanes induce, I don't have data. We are still in the process of trying to figure some of that out. Um, we did, um, but we are, because we don't collect um, real-time counts of our streets, we're looking at ways we can use our cameras to do that so that we could actually have had, over time, a much more refined way of saying, okay, well, well here's when the scooter started, and and be able to have counts that say before and after. We just don't have the infrastructure at the moment set up, but we are working on that right now. Yeah, let's go in the back. Uh, your like, administrative regulations things you discussed a lot about the day-to-day -day operations and allocation and maintenance and operations of the devices. What is the city doing in terms of governing the collection and the charging of the scooters? Because that seems to be where the biggest carbon emissions come from. That is a good question. Um, not a whole lot. <laughs> Except for to say, we want those to be more sustainable. Um, it, I think it falls in the category of stuff that we were so busy just getting the bases covered early on that we didn't push that hard in that realm. And we look back and go, hmm, that's a missing piece. So I think 
we are looking to, to have something more uh, productive to influence that now. We, one thing that did help was um, uh, midway through, we established a team. We actually hired out to help with impounding because we had we only have one code enforcement officer dedicated to the system, and basically, you know, she can only really impound a couple a day, realistically, uh, maybe eight on a good day. And so we ha actually got a really uh, cost-effective group of folks that that they just go out. They're not trying to find things to impound, but if something's literally laying in the street or on, on the curb ramp or whatever, they would go and impound. That got the company's attention. And after that time, we did see a lot more field crews. We started to see the tricycles from the different companies. We saw them going around on e-bikes. Um, so we started to see a difference in operations when the city flexed a little bit. So that was interesting. It's not generally how we wanted to handle a partnership. That wasn't how we wanted it to be. But it did. It was noticeable that it, it resulted in that. So I think our regulations just need to take a step forward and figure out to do something more in partnership. That group helping you impound, are they like volunteer residents or a contractor being paid by the city? It's a contractor. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they came, this was talking about uh, uh, business development. It, it's a whole new business <laughs> <laughs> they came up with. They, and at one point they pitched us that they're like, we know how to scuba, so we actually could go into the ocean. <laughs> and get the ones on the ocean too, and they're like, next time. <laughs> what are the compound rates like? Like how many a day or a month? Uh, they ended up going to, I want to say it was between 130 and 150 a month. Okay. So, and they were only working busier days, so we didn't have them do five days a week. We had them do like four, I want to say. We did weekends and things. Because we also have the problem that city staff aren't working evenings and weekends, and so then that's like kind of when it was the worst. So. Um, I think one of the exciting programs outside of mobility that Santa Monica is doing is the Uni Universal Basic Income Pilot. Um, where you, the city is paying rent for older adults. And I think that that is a really effective equity model. And so I'm wondering if you're thinking about in kind of the, you know, the program 2.0, is there a way to take the lessons of just paying people um, as a way to increase equity in the scooter program? Yeah, it was one of the ways that we had success with Breeze. We worked through Community Core Santa Monica, which does most of our affordable housing kind of management, development and management. And so the ways that we had gotten there with Breeze was to say, we partnered with Community, Community Corps and they, they ended up paying for the Breeze membership. Well, we first gave them a very deeply subsidized one and then they ended up mostly paying for the residents to have access. So yeah, I mean, I think that, that some tie in there would be helpful. Um, yeah, but we haven't figured out enough of it to know if that's the right model and if that's palatable to the finance department. <laughs> But yeah, it's a good model. You're right. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit more about like public sector competition? Because I realized I noticed that Metro Bike Share is also in Santa Monica, and how does yeah. that play out with like the Breeze Bike Share? And if Breeze is falling in ridership, could like Metro potentially feel like yeah, because their bikes could be like the jump bike? <laughs> Um, so we'd be into that if it didn't cost so darn much. Um, so initially, we were in a we were in a bit of an arms race with Metro on the bike share thing because we had gone out and gotten the grant and been ready to roll. And around that time, just this ancient history now, but like when Villaraigosa was mayor, there was a random announcement that he was going to work with Next Bike. Right, ancient history in mobility, but like he was going to work with Next Bike, and they were going to give was it Next Bike. I can't remember. No, Bike, Nation. Bike Nation. Bike Nation. Thank Nation. you. Yeah, that no longer exists. It's no longer, yeah, no longer <laughs> exists. Uh, and that he was going to route four thousand bikes in the city like tomorrow, and it was going to be great. And so we went, whoa, uh, whoa, uh, okay, uh, we got to retool. So we paused for a second, and then uh, and then that didn't happen. And so then we were like, whoa, okay, we paused, and now our grant clock is ticking, and we have to go. So we started going, and then Metro woke up and went, well, we're going to do bike sharing. You should stop, and you should let us do it. And we were like, ah. So we weren't against it. The problem was is that we had this grant money and we also knew, well, we suspected and we're right, that our operations would be cheaper for us if we did our model as opposed to their model. And uh, it, it maintains, it is still true to this day that the way, unfortunately, that Metro Bike Share financials are set up 
it is very hard for small cities to participate because you're on the hook for 50% of the capital cost. You pay half the cost of the bikes and they continue to own them. And you pay 60% of the operating. Uh, and they, it first was pitched as after sponsorship, but they never got a sponsor. So you pay 60% of operations cost. And that, if you add it up over time, can be millions of dollars a year. And for us, that would have just been untenable. I mean, we've been, I mean, honestly, we have basically been able to run Breeze because ridership was so good and Hulu, this Hulu sponsorship was so generous. We ran in the black for three years. We didn't, have, there was no public subsidy for it at all. And it's just in the last year that it's, it's cost like, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year uh, as the ridership fell. So for the most part, I think financially it's been better for us to do that. Now, we have gone to Metro in recent history and said, would you like to reconsider your model? Because we don't need to run bike share. We just need bike share service. Um, and that hasn't really hasn't moved, but I don't want to say it will never move. Um, I think we're sort of agnostic. As long as the service is good, uh, the bikes are in good shape, and uh, it's affordable, we're game for anything. Yeah. Um, jumping back to the, the charging and rebalancing, um, uh, the last section of the series was talking about labor and um, independent contracting versus uh, empl employment. Um, do you know how the companies do that with the people who charge and repair and rebalance the bikes? And do you have anything in the regulations about that? Yeah, we have an encouragement statement that we would like them to be employees. And we asked when we had the competitive bidding process how they intended to go. Like, was it mostly contractor? Was it mostly uh, full salaried employees? And um, over time, we get a lot of different pieces, bits and pieces of sometimes inconsistent information from the companies about how operations are going. Um, so at present, I would say my perception is that the number of employees has increased over time, but that many are still highly dependent upon uh, sort of dispersed, you know, random workforce. Um, it isn't something we have demanded, but it is... And interestingly, it wasn't something our council picked up on extensively either, but I think it's embedded in this idea of, of life cycle sustainability and full system sustainability. Like, I think you can't really get there unless you have a little bit clearer idea of what types of vehicles are actually doing the balancing, or you move towards an in-the-field battery swap, which I think is where a lot of the companies would prefer to go, because whether it's your employee or it's someone you pay, it's still expensive to move people to them. It's much easier if you could just have someone who goes around and replaces, which works for us too. So that's my suspicion of where it will go. And then likely more, li well, actually I don't know if they would hire as employees or if they would do this contract. I don't know. I would assume it'd be employees because you have control of the assets, right? So they probably want to have some control of the person. But yeah, it's a challenge. It's been a challenge and it's been tough to just Tim has to plug his ears, but it has been tough to get accurate, consistent information from the companies for the entire year. Um, sorry. <laughs> but it's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, from a city perspective, your take on dockless versus docked systems and like how they work for your citizens and how they work as a regulator? Yeah, I, so we, we chose smart bikes early on when that was not a known thing, and we were very happy with it, but we also had, because we were the owner, had control over a pretty good incentive structure where we took, you know, you had to pay $2 to park outside of this, you could park outside of the this, this stations, <coughs> but you had to pay $2, but then someone could make a dollar if they brought it back to the station, and that worked out really well. Uh, and so we sort of thought, oh, that's a good sweet spot. And so when the fully um, dockless came, we were like, well, well, they could always do an incentive structure, so that could work. But it, it has not worked well, and that's partly because the incentive structures just haven't been put very much in place. So I don't want to say that it can't work, um, but I want to say that it, I don't know that in balance. Well, speaking for me, not the city, but speaking for me. I'm not sure that the chaos that being dockless creates is worth the absolute point-to-point -point flexibility that it provides. Like I, I think in, it depends on the context. I think in a dense area where you have a lot of demand for sidewalk space and you have a lot of people with doing a lot of different things, I don't think it's too much to say block to block. I think walking 150, 200 feet is fine and it, and it and in balance gives you the sort of 
functional public space that we're all trying to manage. When you get into the residential area, I don't know, maybe you could go more dockless. You know, I think that it, it, it is a little bit dependent upon the density of your context and the demand for the public space. Um, I think one thing that seems pretty clear from the council discussion as we've been talking about is like this idea of kind of subzones. Like we do have the benefit of having a pretty rich backend data uh, database. So why not use that to our advantage and maybe create some more micro zones where maybe the rules could be slightly different and the infrastructure could be slightly different depending on it. So um, yeah, I think in downtowns and things, I'm, I'm, I'd like to see us move more towards a block to block because we can put in, or maybe two spots per block or something, but something where it starts to get organized because it's, it's, uh, it's awfully hard to help avoid uh, someone in a wheelchair getting stuck um, without having something that organizes it, or a lock too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we had Anuj Gupta speak to us about uh, the, the program as a whole, and he was saying that if uh, city residents at the time that it was implemented had their way, they probably wouldn't have passed it, and it was sort of a decision that Santa Monica made to go ahead. Can you speak to sort of the community perspective now? Has there been any warming to it, or are people, and he spoke specifically that, you know, there's a lot of older residents in Santa Monica that just frankly were opposed to it. Can you speak about where uh, public opinion on it is now? It's it's warmer. Yeah. It's warmer. Um, there, according to so the you the it's warmer in what we hear. It was interesting when we did a general community survey. So we did two user surveys that got about four thousand responses, and then we did a user a non user just a general public survey, and we ended up splitting the data into into people results into people who had ridden uh, had never ridden or ridden once versus ridden two or more times. And they were completely split on whether they thought that scooters had been a positive uh, addition to the transportation options in the city. 65% of people who had never ridden said no, nope, and 65% of the people who had ridden them said yes. Uh, so clearly, not riding is you know is a is a def is a deciding factor whether or not you think and. Part of it is you probably self-select not to write because you think they're dumb or you're scared of them or whatever. Um, but it's interesting to know that that's such a it's such a break. Um, generally speaking, though, um, I think with a few exceptions, generally comments have been more nuanced, right? And this is true with any change, right? So I think it's followed a, a good traditional path of kind of acceptance. Yeah, go over here. The beach path has recently undergone some undergone some widening. Um, mm -hmm. Has there been any discussion of perhaps reopening that to, to motorized shared vehicles? Yeah, yeah. I think we'd like to once we have uh, have a fully separated path both north and south of the pier. The council's expressed some interest, and we've got interest in doing so too. Um, so yeah, we'll probably still want some speed limits, but generally, yeah. Uh, can you talk about the curbside plan, uh, about the control plan? Uh, 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 last week, uh, I've been to the Monica. I found <coughs> it's an interesting thing. So the curbside, there's a lot of dedicated uh, 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 parking area for the micro uh, it's, it's It looks like a macro half station. You can, back, uh, you can park your own bike or use the bike sharing <coughs> or scooter. So I just want to know how do you design and deploy it and how the company comes with it. How do we design uh, and, uh, uh, and deploy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so those areas have been super helpful in, in particularly in the deployment side of things, because I think it's it's much easier for the companies to have their to to signal to their staff and or contractors to use those to, those areas. And we have seen pretty good use of them for deployments. Um, we're not seeing great use of them by the riders. We're seeing a pretty low percentage of people actually ending their rides in those zones. Um, but I think the deployment part has been has been really positive. Um, the companies share them. I mean, there is a little bit of gamesmanship we see where someone will fill it up with their all their devices and we haven't gotten into the weeds about saying, like, don't use the whole thing. Or, you know, that's just more than we can probably even oversee. Um, so there is some gaming that ha happens with them, but generally speaking, um, they've helped to at least start the education process with the community and with users and non-users to help to give some signals in the world what they 
what we want to start seeing happen. Um, it'll be interesting when we move them into the street because um, it's going to require a lot more upsetting of people's um, what the current street use is, right? So we'll probably have to take out some parking spaces, we'll probably have to move some other uses around. And so we're going to see, I think, more, um, a little bit more friction as we move forward and having more of them. We probably have time for one more question. Um, in terms of making demand and creating new trips, uh, is there any way that the city is trying to gauge? Like, I know you discussed the little displacement, but what kind of new trips are being created as a result of this You know, we didn't really ask questions like that. Um, in fact, I'm not even sure that the survey asked whether or not you would have not made the trip, right? And that sort of like, what would you otherwise have done? I don't think we even asked whether you would have not made the trip. Um, it's an interesting question. We, I think, assume that it has opened up some flexibility, um, but it's an assumption more than knowledge, I think. Um, but that would be a good thing for us to ask, I think, in the next go round. Um, to get some clarity. I mean, it's it's generally our disposition, and this, you know, maybe we're having confirmation bias, but like, it's our disposition that the more options you provide, the more you can bring more people to the table. I'm trying to think. I mean, the one thing we have is the TD, is the uh, employer records. Um, but again, it might, yeah, that's an interesting question. We'll have to look at that some more. That's a good thought. Okay, uh, let's thank Francie for. <laughs>